So we're dealing with ideal gas mixtures, and we've solved, uh, been able to describe them on a mass basis, mole basis, and then, then solve some problems. We need to start moving into psychrometrics, and psychrometrics is a nice complicated word, but it's a study of moist air. Moist air. That's all it is. So first concept is dry air. Air, if it has no humidity, no water vapor in it, is made up of primarily nitrogen and oxygen, and then there's a distant third and a distant fourth. I don't, I can't remember if it's argon or CO2, but they're, they really fall off. It's primarily a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. So it's about 79% uh, and 21%. If you just neglect the rest of these, and they're not, you know, just for some energy calculations, and humidity calculations, you just approximate dry air as being 79% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. It then has a molar mass for dry air of 28.97 kilograms per kilomole. True? Okay. Then we have moisture, and it's now moist air, and so it'll be the dry air plus H2O vapor, water vapor. And that's what we're breathing. You know, that's what we deal with a lot. So as the amount of moisture goes up, the amount of dry air goes down a little bit to make room for the moisture at constant pressure. And then you can only put so much moisture into air. Then it becomes saturated, true? So saturated air is, if you tried to put more water vapor into it, it wouldn't hold it, it would do out or condense out, okay? So this is when you have the maximum. So what is, how do we describe the maximum? Well, we had this for an ideal gas mixture, the concept of partial pressures. And so the total gas pressure of the moist air is made up of the dry air contribution or the partial pressure associated with the dry air plus the partial pressure associated with the water vapor or the vapor pressure. Okay? That partial pressure associated with the water vapor. That's right. Yeah. So let's say we started where, where the total pressure was 100 kPa and it was dry air to begin with. Well, the partial pressure of water vapor and dry air is zero, so the, the dry air partial pressure is 100 kPa. True? But let's say uh, you, you went to moist air. So with moist air, maybe the partial pressure went up to 1 kPa. Well, then you have 99 kPa for the dry air to, to remain at 100 total. Total. Okay. And then maybe it went to 2 kPa. Well, then it went to 98. So that it makes room. It makes room for the, uh, for the moisture. So what is the maximum that the partial pressure can be? Well, the maximum is when it's the saturation pressure, and that's straight out of the tables. And so we can look up at a given temperature the saturation pressure for steam. That would be then the maximum partial pressure. So if I just grab a number, let's say it's uh, 20 degrees C, the saturation pressure at 20 degrees C is 2.339 kPa. So I could not have a partial pressure of water vapor at 20 degrees C above that. The maximum it would be is 2.339, okay? So uh, here's a, a measure of the relative humidity. Often we use the symbol phi for relative humidity. It's defined as the mole fraction of the vapor in the moist air mixture divided by the mole fraction of vapor if it would be saturated at the same temperature and pressure. So this is the maximum. 
and both of these are at the same temperature and pressure. Okay, the total pressure of the air. The total pressure. Okay. Well, uh, we recall that the partial pressure, let me kind of tuck it over here, P sub I is equal to Y sub I times P total. True? The concept of partial pressure, mole fractions. So you can replace the ratio of Y sub V by the partial pressure of the vapor divided by the maximum partial pressure. Well, we already just talked about what that is. That's the saturation pressure at that temperature and pressure. Don't change the total pressure. Okay? So there's the definition of relative humidity. Uh, this relative humidity changes dramatically. You can feel it in the summertime in Houston. It's very hot, high humidity, right? You can feel the moisture. It, it, it's harder to breathe for those that are used to dry climates. You go to El Paso and uh, you can uh, feel the dryness if you're not used to the dry, right? I mentioned my son's tending Texas Tech. He just drove down for spring break. What was it last week? He goes, whoa, it's so humid in San Antonio. It's like, what? Well, he's been up in Lubbock. It's dry, right? And so you get acclimated to it. Okay. Well, the next concept that we need to deal with is dew point temperature. Well, what is dew point temperature? Think about in the 24-hour day. Here is high noon. Here is midnight. So here again is midnight, right? So we go to the next day at midnight. And if you plotted temperature, you would probably find that around 6 a.m. most days, you get the lowest of the low temperature because the sun is now going to start rising and it's going to start pumping energy into our atmosphere, true? But over the night, it's been radiatively cooling, radiatively cooling. So the temperature is typically a low right there. It's been coming down. Then the sun comes up and it peaks maybe at 2 or 3, 4 o'clock. And then it starts heading back down. And there you go. And this is supposed to match up with that temperature right there because it's a cycle. All right. And what, what you know is that when the air is very high temperature, it can hold a lot of moisture. But when it's at a low temperature, it can't hold a lot of moisture. And sometimes the, and at night, the temperature gets below the dew point temperature. And you get water coming out of the air and collecting on your lawn, on your car, on driveways, on roofs, and other places. It didn't rain, but there's definitely water. It's condensate coming out of the air. It's, the temperature went below the dew point temperature for whatever condition it was. Okay. Now, if you're in Houston, almost every morning it's wet on the lawn. If you're in El Paso, very rarely. Is it wet with dew on the lawn and you're on your car? Because it didn't have a lot of moisture in the beginning of the hot day before it started cooling off at night. San Antonio, some days you'll go out, your car will be all slobbery with dew. Some days it'll be dry. Maybe the temperature's below freezing. Some days you'll have frost on your car, frost on your roof. Some days you won't, depending on how much moisture there was at the beginning. So these concepts you're already very familiar with, relative humidity and dew point temperature, as well as just the dry bulb temperature. Yes, sir? Yes, and we're going to deal with it, but we're going to swallow the elephant one small bite at a time. So let's master the concept of dew point, and then we'll move on. So here's a problem says we have air, moist air, it's at 100 kPa, 101 atm, 30 degrees C, it's pretty warm, and a 50% relative humidity. The air is now cooled at constant pressure. We're not changing the pressure. So it stays always at 100 kPa total pressure. Determine the relative humidity if the air is cooled to 27 or 25 or 23. It's progressively cooled. What would the relative humidity do, you know, as it's progressively cooled? What do you think it's going to do? It starts 
when it was at 30 degrees C, maybe I should have left room in there, at 30 degrees C, it was 50%. What do you think the relative humidity is going to be at 27, 25, etc., all the way down to 18 degrees C? All I'm doing is cooling it. It's going to go up. It's going to creep up. Okay? Let me just tell you the answer before I calculate the answers so that you can see the big picture because that's what I want you to see. We can grind through the mathematics. But it, uh, it goes to 59.5% or let's just say 60%. It jumps 10% if you cool it 3 degrees. Cool it another five degree, uh, 2 degrees down to 25, it jumps to 76%. Okay? Cool it another uh, 2 degrees to 23 degrees, it jumps, um, I'm sorry, it jumped from 60 to 67 percent, then it jumps to 76 percent, then at uh, 20 degrees C, it jumps to 91 percent, and then if you try to calculate it for 18 degrees C, it comes in at 103 percent. What do you think about 103 percent? Something happened where it hit 100% in a temperature between 20 and 18 degrees C. It became saturated air. That dew point was hit. So this, these conditions up here tell you some dew point temperature for that moist air. And that moist air dew point is calculated to be 18.4 degrees C. How many people listen to the Weather Channel or anything like that? And you'll see everything. They'll say, okay, the temperature, the pre barometric pressure, the wind, and they'll often quote the dew point. They'll tell you the dew point temperature. It's telling you how much humidity is. They could tell you the relative humidity you calculate the dew point. But anyway, um, so what they're doing when they tell you the dew point is, is if it cools to that temperature, you're going to get water condensing out right okay well how do they make these calculations well here's the important data that you need you're going to need to know the saturation pressure at all of these temperatures true so what we first do is we say the relative humidity is equal to the ratio of the actual mole fraction of vapor water vapor in our moist air mixture divided by the maximum that it could possibly ever be at that temperature okay if it was if it was saturated okay and that turns out to be pv divided by p sat or a lot of times we unravel it and we say the partial pressure is equal to the relative humidity times the saturation pressure true true okay so we can say that the uh, partial pressure is 50% times 4.246 kPa and we calculate that that partial pressure is equal to 2.123 kPa that's that's the pressure the vapor exerts at these condition of the moist air okay so what happens is is he as is the total pressure going to be changing as I cool it? No, it remains constant. It doesn't change. It always stays 100 kPa. True? Does the partial pressure of the dry air change as I cool it? No, it stays constant until some of the water vapor goes away. It condenses. So the partial pressure of the vapor stays constant until it hits the dew point. After that, there's not as much ideal gas water vapor in our moist air. It goes, it condenses out. All right. <clears throat> but during this cooling process, this stays constant. So what we do is we say, what's the new relative humidity at 27? Well, the new relative humidity is going to be the PV divided by PSAT. Well, what changed then wasn't PV. That didn't change, but PSAT changed. It dropped. The capacity to hold water vapor 
was reduced as the temperature reduced. Or the te it dropped as the temperature dropped. So this becomes, how did we calculate 60%? It was 2.123 divided by 3.567 kPa's. Likewise, how did we calculate 67%? 2.123 divided by, at 25 degrees C, the saturation pressure, 3.169. See what we're doing? The amount of water vapor is not changing. The mole fraction is not changing. The partial pressure is not changing. What's changing is, is the ability to hold a bunch of water vapor because it's cooler air. It's The saturation pressure is going down. This is going down, hence the relative humidity is going up until it hits 100%. That's when it when it cools to the when it gets 100%, then you hit your dew point. So usually you have to do a little interpolation to find your dew point temperature. Um, you just look at your temperature and PSAT, and uh, you find two values: 18 degrees C and 19 degrees C. That bracket or uh, the value of the PSAT that you have of interest. And we find that we wanted to calculate it at 2.123. Uh, Do a little, hey, linear interpolation. And you find that the temperature dew point, 18.4 degrees C. I've never found it easy for students to grasp dew point temperature. You have to work at it. You have to work at it, okay? This is a tricky concept. Work at it, please. Humidity ratio. Well, uh, humidity ratio is a term that engineers that deal in moist air calculations, especially consulting engineers that do out do layouts of buildings for air conditioning, for climate control inside of buildings and museums and factories. They love this term. Uh, this is widely used. Well, it's given the symbol omega. It's, it's close to the relative humidity, but it's not. It's the same idea, though. It's, it's a measure of how much moisture is in our air. Okay. Probably a nice way to think about it is just say omega is the symbol, and here are the units. It's kilograms of water vapor per kilogram of dry air. Those are the units for, for this variable. You units, okay? <clears throat> so I need to somehow calculate this ratio. Now, it's not trivial to calculate. I mean, it will show it, will drive it. It looks re re really easy after you do it once or twice, but um, what I want to do is just stare at the units for a while. It's kilograms of vapor in the ideal gas mixture made up of dry air and water vapor per kilogram of dry air in the mixture. It's not per kilogram of dry air and vapor in the mixture. It's not that. Okay? All right. Why do they like this variable? Well, in a lot of applications, you may have a duct, you may have air coming in and air going out, and it's moist air here and it's moist air here. And if you have a cooling coil and you cool off that air, you try to drop the temperature because it's hot and humid out. You need to provide cool air inside the building. Guess what you better have right underneath that cooling coil? Guess what you must have? What did I just show? A drain, a drip pan to catch the what? The condensation. The condensation, and it's going to sweat off that coil. Anybody seen the air conditioner in a window unit, and you go on the outside, and it's dripping water? And the first when you see that in your little kid, you're saying, where's the leak? True. That water's coming out of the air. And in this building, when you put air across cooling coils, you got to worry about possibly condensing uh, and getting some of that, wringing some of that moisture out of the air, and you have to deal with it. So what stays constant? Is it the mass flow rate of the dry air and vapor that stays constant from the inlet to the outlet across the cooling coil? Is it the mass flow rate of the vapor that stays constant from, no, some of that vapor is going to condense. So what stays constant is the mass flow rate of the dry air. 
That's why we like this ratio. That's why we like this ratio. Okay? Because the mass flow rate of the dry air is always constant. And so that motivates this definition for a humidity ratio. Okay, well, how do I calculate the humidity ratio? Go back to this equation. P V, let me do it with a cap V, is equal to M R T. Ideal gas equation? Let's do this. Let's write it twice. The partial pressure for the vapor, let's write it for the water. And then let's write it for the dry air. Okay, So we're thinking about the partial pressure of the water vapor in a given volume, Okay, the mass of the vapor, and we have R, which is R bar divided by the molar mass of the vapor, and then we have the mixture temperature. True? Do you like that equation as I've written it? Okay, let's do it also for the dry air. So we have the partial pressure of the dry air, some volume, the mass of the dry air, R bar divided by the molar mass of the dry air, temperature. True? Do you like that? Good. So now if you say omega is going to be the ratio of the mass of the vapor divided by the mass of the dry air, can I replace the numerator by P of the vapor, volume, molar mass of the vapor divided by R bar, T. Can I do that just for the numerator? And then for the denominator, can I do partial pressure of the dry air, volume, molar mass of dry air, divided by R bar T. Do you see what we did? Now, can we cancel some terms? I hope we can. R bars go, temperatures go, the volume goes, and we're left with that the humidity ratio is the mass, the molar mass of the vapor divided by the molar mass of dry air times the partial pressure of the vapor divided by the partial pressure of dry air. If you grab a calculator and you say, what's the molar mass of water vapor? 18.02. What's the molar mass of dry air? 28.97. True. P, P dot dry air. This number is almost never reported as 18.02 divided by 28.97. It's reported as 0 0.622. Now, on my calculator, that's good to five digits. I've never seen this reported to five digits in any book. It's always reported to 0 0.622. You would think it's some fundamental constant like pi, but it's just the ratio of molar masses. That's all it is. And they almost always just put 0.622 and that's it. And now you have PV over PDA. So that's how you calculate this omega, this humidity ratio. Make sense? Very good. Here's a problem. We have a room. It contains air at 30 degrees C and 97 kPa. What is that pressure? Is that a total pressure of 97 kPa? Or is that the partial pressure or something? What is it? Total, total. Very good. The partial pressure of the water vapor is given to be 3.567 kPa in this moist air mixture that's occupying the room. Now determine the partial pressure of the dry air. So what's PDA? What is that partial pressure of the dry air? Really easy. We love easy questions. So it's P total minus PV and you can run that number So we get that partial pressure of the dry air is 93.4 kPa. That's the answer to part A. How about what is the relative humidity? The symbol for that is phi, right? Relative humidity. We recall 
relative humidity is mole fraction of vapor in the moist air mixture divided by the maximum mole fraction if it would be saturated at the same temperature and pressure. And then we can replace the Ys of V by um, PV and replace this by PSAT. This ratio of the actual vapor pressure to the saturation pressure. So what is our actual? It's going to be 3.567 kPa. What is our saturation pressure at 30 degrees C? And you have to look that up and you find that the saturation pressure 30 degrees C is 4.246 kPa and you calculate the relative humidity to be 84 percent. How about the dew point temperature? Well, if I want to write it in a, an equation, what I'm doing is I'm saying the dew point temperature is when the um, saturation pressure at a given special temperature called the dew point temperature is equal to the current partial pressure of the vapor in the moist air mixture. Current partial pressure is equal to 3.567 kPa. So I'm looking for that temperature such that the saturation pressure is equal to that value. So I go into the steam tables and I look and I find temperature column, the PSAT column, and I start looking and I find, hey, somebody concocted this problem because there's a value good to four digits. No interpolation required. There's a saturation pressure of 3.576 in my table. And that corresponds to a temperature of, all I do is look over, 27 degrees C. And so the temperature, dew point temperature is 27 degrees C. What happens if it would have been, you know, 3.5 without the 6.7? Do a little interpolation. It'd be very close to 27 degrees C. So that's the answer to part C. D. What is the mass of the water vapor if the mass of dry air is 10 kilograms. So they, they're giving you, let me try to do this over here, the mass of the dry air is 10 kilograms in this mixture. But what is going to be then the amount of vapor that matches that, that's in that, you know, that corresponds to that same volume or same size of extent of, of air, moist air? Well, you just use the ideal gas equation. Could you use the ideal gas equation like this? Could you say the total volume is equal to the mass of dry air times R bar divided by the molar mass of dry air times the temperature of the moist air mixture divided by the partial pressure of the dry air? What it's saying is, is if you told me I have 10 kilograms of dry air, I could find the volume that it's occupied, knowing the partial pressure of the dry air, et cetera, the temperature. And then once I know the volume occupied, I just use the ideal gas equation again to get the mass of the vapor is equal to the partial pressure of the water vapor, the volume that same volume, the molar mass of the vapor, not dry air, divided by R bar T. Okay? And so let's do this the long way. You can calculate this volume to be 9.30687 meters cubed, and then plug that in here. And then you could calculate the mass of the vapor to be 0 0.2375 kilograms. So let me put mass of the vapor is equal to 
somebody says, why did you stop and compute V as an entity? Why don't you just substitute V in there as a, as a bunch of symbols, cancel a bunch of terms? And guess what? Sure, you can do that. You would count MV is equal to, you would get molar mass of vapor divided by the molar mass of dry air times the partial pressure of the vapor divided by the partial pressure of the dry air after all the calcs cancel. True? And then I'd also have the mass of the dry air. That's the last term, mass of the dry air. Somebody says, I recognize this. What is that? Humidity ratio times the mass of the dry air. So either one, you could stop and calculate the humidity ratio and then get the answer to part D or just get the answer to part D and then say, oh, I see part E requires me to calculate the humidity ratio. <laughs> well, one short way to calculate the humidity ratio, if you already went the long way on part D, would be, say, the mass of the vapor I just calculated. They told me the mass of the dry air was starting with 10 kilograms. Humidity ratio is mass of vapor divided by mass of dry air. Humidity ratio 0 0.02375 kilograms of vapor per kilogram of dry air. Often, omega, humidity ratio, kilogram per kilogram, they cancel it. But you need to know that it's two types of kilograms. One is vapor and one is dry air. So they'll often just put it like this with no dimensions. If you go back to the equation and you say, I want to calculate it this way, the same answer. Did you follow that? Very good. All right. Do you want to play with this problem or call it a day? You want to play with it? Play with it? Okay. What I'll do is uh, we'll just jump through this and go a little slower. Uh, moist air at 80 degrees C and a total pressure of 400 kPa. Whenever you see this, it's four times the atmospheric pressure. Okay? You can still have air at 400 kPa. But it's not the type of air that we want to be breathing. We don't want to be in an environment that's four bar. Okay? Not good for us. All right? But you can, and some men and, and, and applications and workers do go deep sea diving and all kinds of high pressures and all kinds of other conditions. But, but normally, this, this you have to really slow down and think. It's not atmospheric pressure. Okay, let's read on. The relative humidity is 75%. Can you still define relative humidity for something that's not near atmospheric pressure? Yes, you can. And you can still define things like dew point temperature and other things. It's contained in a given rigid closed vessel. So it's not escaping and it's not expanding. It's a control mass analysis. That's what's calling out thermodynamics lingo here. The tank contents are cooled. How do you cool tank contents? With a heat transfer. So, so uh, you can think about the state one and then state two of the tank, and you're cooling it. So you have Q1 to 2. Now, because we want to stay with our sign convention, put Q going in as heating it, right? And then we'll use our thermo sign conventions. If they ask the question, what is the heat transfer in kilojoules if the final temperature in the tank is 60 degrees? They cooled it from 80 to 60. True? All right, let's slug through this. What I would do is introduce a control volume or control mass. Control mass, a closed system, so don't use volume, say mass. That's the focus of the study. We would write the first law for that closed system, will we not? What's it look like? Well, heat in, any work out, no, but we'll write it and then strike it, is equal to cap U2 minus cap U1. True or false? Do you like that? Very good. So we're asked to calculate the heat transfer in kilojoules. We know that the sign will be different. It'll be negative because it's not into the system. It's out. But 
how do we deal with this U2 minus U1? It's a gas mixture. It's humid air. It's made of two components, dry and vapor. True? So could I write it like this? Could I say the mass of the dry air times U2 minus U1 of the dry air plus the mass of the vapor, U2 minus U1 of the vapor. Look good so far? So what I've done is just sum up the, the contribution due to the change in internal energy of the dry air with the change in internal energy of the vapor. Now, what we want to do is we want to say, how do I calculate things like the mass of the dry air? Well, it's a little bit of work. But you come over to the side. The mass of the dry air is equal to the partial pressure of dry air, the volume of the tank, which is given to be 2.5 cubic meters, the molar mass of dry air divided by the gas constant, universal gas constant, and the temperature. Now, if I know it at state one, it would be preferable to go ahead and just get the the, the dry air partial pressure at the initial state and the temperature at the initial state. And it's a closed system. Once I calculate the mass of the dry air, it stays the same. There's nothing escaping, true? So that helps. So let's take a look. What is the partial pressure of the dry air at state one? How do I calculate that? Partial pressure of the dry air at state one. It'll be the total pressure at state one minus the vapor pressure at state one, true? Okay, so I know the total pressure is 400 kPa. How do I get the partial pressure of vapor at state one? Use that relative humidity, true. And so is the partial pressure of the vapor at state one equal to the relative humidity at one times the saturation pressure at the 80 degrees C at that temperature one. Does that make sense? Okay, so I can calculate now the mass of the dry air. Let me continue right here for a minute since I, in principle, can calculate the mass of the dry air. What can I do with this change in U? I like to just say, C sub V of the dry air times T2 minus T1. Somebody says, Professor, we have tables for dry air. We can get uh, very accurate for you know changes in internal energy. We just go to our air tables. Fine, but it's only changing from 80 degrees C to 60 degrees C. It's not changing from 50 to, to, to 600 degrees C or something ridiculous, right? So tables are a little bit overkill. Let's just get a specific heat, constant specific heat. True? This is a small temperature change. All right, and, and I think it reveals that the change in the internal energy of the air is due to its temperature change. It's, it's in this model, linearly proportional to the temperature change. True? Now, let's go to the water vapor. What is the mass of vapor? How am I going to calculate that? You can do it very similar to what we just did right here. We can go the pressure of the vapor initial, the total volume of my tank, the molar mass of vapor, water vapor 18.02, divided by R bar T1, true? And then what was the partial pressure? What's PV1? Well. We had to calculate it right there, true? There's another way to do it. Um, do it this way. If, could I calculate humidity ratio at state one? Sure. It's equal to 0.622 PV divided by PDA at state one, right? At PDA at state one, PV at state one, ratio molar masses. We had the humidity ratio. Humidity ratio at state one was kilogram vapor per kilogram dry air. True. So if we take and we calculate MV by omega one times 
MDA, the answer from part A. You can do it that way. You'll get the same answer. It's like a forest with a bunch of trees. You can go around to the right or around to the left, but as long as you don't get lost in the forest, you'll get there. Okay? So we get the mass of the vapor. Now the question is, how can I handle this, this, this U? Well, okay, let's do this. If it, we could use the steam tables. And we could just get U sub G at temperature T2 minus U sub G at the temperature T1. And that'll be very accurate. Okay? That'll be good. It'll be accurate. Somebody says, I think there's a specific heat for water vapor in the ideal gas region. Yes, you can do it that way. C sub V times T2 minus T1. This is specific heat for constant volume for water vapor. Water vapor. You can do it that way as well. Yes, sir. Uh, whenever you see it for air, it's for dry air because that's all they have. They didn't, it would be, yes, it's for dry air. And then the specific heat of vape constant volume for water vapor is in some textbooks. I don't think it's in this textbook. I don't think it's in the tables for this textbook. I know it's in other textbooks that we've used to teach this, this class out of. But when I go back to table A20, I see air, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen. And so that air is dry air. And I can get the C sub B value for it. But for the vapor, you know, so you're almost preferably forced in that direction for the vapor. Okay. This looks all hunky dory, except for you're a little suspicious because now they throw you part B. They cool it off to 30 degrees C. What could change? What could happen? We should find out what the dew point temperature is for the initial condition. And if the dew point temperature for our moist air, even at that elevated pressure, is below 20 degrees or 30 degrees C, we're happy. It's always vapor. But it may be between 60 and 30. The first case, it may stay all vapor. The second case, you may have some condensed. So what would happen in case two is you would get a little bit of LIQ down here. It would take up an infinitesimally small volume, but you could even account for the volume that it took up out of the 2.5 cubic meter tank. All right. But what do you think about the energy implications? and be huge. It takes a lot of energy. Take a look in the tables at U sub F and U sub G because isn't the if it's liquid, it's U sub F. It's, it's in uh, equilibrium with the vapor at U sub G. But what's the relative magnitude of U sub F and U sub G? Let's just look for it right away. It's at 80 degrees C, but we're going to cool it Let's say it's at 30 degrees C for comparison purposes. 30 degrees C, U sub F, 126 kilojoules per kilogram. U sub G, 2,417 kilojoules per kilogram. It's a big difference. So there was a lot more Q removed in order to get some of the vapor to condense. All right? So what you have to do is you have to do this. You have to consider, calculate the mass that remains in the vapor state at the final and the mass that went into the liquid in the final. Okay? This is the mass of the water that's liquid final. Okay? And then you can uh, bust this into two parts for the, for the water. You have the mass of the water that is in the vapor state at the final and the mass of the water that's at the liquid state final. See, 
See, both of those have to sum up to be the amount of vapor initially all in the gas. True? But, but, but they're going to sum them up, and you've got to figure out which one is which. And this one is a change in, it. well, it goes from uh, use of G at 2, use of G at 1. But what's this one do? It started use of G at T1, 80 degrees C. It's use of F at T2, whatever it is, 30 degrees C. See that? So we make it into two ideal gases, and then what went out of the gas and turned into liquid for the energy balance. And even though this may be a small amount of mass, the difference in the internal energy going from vapor to liquid is big, is big. If it's under the dew point temperature, exactly right. What is the dew point temperature for this condition? I didn't calculate it, did I? How do you calculate the dew point temperature? Well, we find out what is the, uh, uh, I got to try and tuck it in somewhere. Let me try and tuck it in right down here. Okay, what is the partial pressure of the vapor uh, initially? Uh, what is the partial pressure? It's a B times, well, it's Y, Y at 1, Y of vapor at 1 times P sat. True? Okay. So we can get this at 80 degrees C, but what is our mole fraction in the vapor state, state 1, 75% relative humidity? Well, that's phi is 75 is equal to PV over P sat at the 80 degrees C. So we first calculate uh, PV from this equation, then put it here, and we get this mole fraction of the vapor initially. As it co is cooling without condensing, that mole fraction will stay the same. Will stay the same. All right. Um, this problem is a little more tricky because does that pressure stay the same as you're cooling it? The pressure is dropping, isn't it? It's, it's going to go from 400 kilopascal and reduce. Not a lot, but it's going to reduce because of the cooling. Okay, so um, what is our dew point temperature f at this initial condition so we get uh, PV Relative humidity, 400 kPa, 80 degrees C. Well, what is our, uh, let me just look it up. 80 degrees C, it's uh, 47.39 kPa. That's PSAT at 80 degrees C. All right. So P vapor is 0.75 times 47.39. True. I, uh, I can run that number right here, 0.75. We're running out of time, 47.39 times. So it's 35.53. I look at the table, 5.4. I look at the table, and I find that it's around between 70 and 75. Between 70 and 75 degrees C. That's the dew point. So it'll even have some condensate forming at 60. Okay. I think we got to exit. All right.